Almost two years after the January 6th attack, our next guest says the Capitol remains vulnerable. He's former Capitol Police Chief Stephen Sund, who resigned one day after the violence of that day, and now sharing his experience in a new book titled Courage Under Fire, Under Siege and Outnumbered 58 to 1 on January 6th. Chief Sun, good morning. Thanks for being with us today. We appreciate it. Good morning, sir. Um, you say right out of the gate that you regret resigning the day after January 6th. Why is that? Um, I'd gotten to know my officers really well. I really enjoyed being a uh, police officer, really enjoyed being a chief, and developed a really good rapport uh, with the department, and the morale was going in the right direction. Um, I think when the speaker went on national TV and called for my resignation, um, I just wish he would have had all the facts going into it about what we faced, what my men and women had to deal with, what I had to deal with trying to protect the, uh, the Capitol before calling for my resignation. So let's we'll go through what happened that day and your point of view, which is so gripping as you read through the pages of this book. But let's talk about the couple of days beforehand. There were from your intelligence division, there was a memo put out that said they'd picked up chatter that something violent potentially was going to happen on January the 6th. Were you aware of that? Did you get those warnings? And if not, how is that possible that the chief of the Capitol Police was not made privy to them? So what you'll find as you go in, in through the book is there's a series of intelligence um, um, assessments that are put out for January 6th, the last one being put out on January 3rd, uh, pretty late in the evening. It comes out, it's a 15-page assessment with a paragraph at the end of it that's talking about um, uh, it could be violent, there could be, um, they, they see this as the last chance um, opportunity to overturn the election. So that one paragraph in itself, pointing out that uh, Congress is the target, you got to understand everybody that comes up to protest on Capitol Hill, their target of uh, their protest is always going to be Congress. Uh, didn't really ring that, oh, hey, well, Armageddon's coming. But the very next day, they put out another assessment. They put out a special event assessment that says low probability of arrest or civil disobedience. They put that out the 4th, the 5th, the 6th. Um, there's briefings with members of Congress that indicate it's going to be very similar to the previous two um, demonstrations, the previous two MAGA demonstrations. So we weren't going into it, and other chiefs have indicated that we we're expecting the type of um, demonstration or type of attack on the Capitol that we encountered. Thousands of people uh, and a coordinated attack on the Capitol did not expect that. And at all. despite that, though, you did ask for the National Guard to be placed on standby, which shows. Uh, I guess, extraordinary level of concern, different than you'd had in, in, a, in other times, and you were denied that request. Why do you suspect you were denied that request? So on January 3rd, when I went in the morning and requested the National Guard, is actually to have them be assigned to our perimeter, not necessarily to be put on standby, but to be assigned to our perimeter. Uh, and that was based on my training and, ex and experience. I've done a lot of special events in Washington, D.C. I knew we were going to have large crowds. And with a joint session of Congress going on, I have a lot of posts inside the building I have to staff. So I now have limited staff for the perimeter. So that's the reason I went and asked for it. And it was, it was concerns over the look of the National Guard on Capitol Hill that prevented the, the Sergeant Arms, Paul Irving, from uh, proving that. You mentioned you were a 25-year police officer with the D.C. Metro Police as well before you joined the Capitol Police and you were 18 months into uh, your time as chief on January 6th. So let's talk about that morning. When did things take a turn from you and you realized that those threat assessments had been underplayed and that you were dealing with something that was going to be violent and that, in fact, the leadership of the country was a target? Um, I can tell you exactly. It's 1253. Uh, when we were in the uh, command center, we were dealing with the pipe bomb that was over at the Republican National Committee. Uh, I was very concerned about that because you're looking at a, a steel pipe bomb with the, uh, that, was, that was concerning. But when I saw the crowd and someone said there's a large crowd approaching uh, our fence line on uh, Peace Circle and um, Garfield Circle, which is on the west front of the Capitol, we saw them approaching and very quickly after they approached it turned violent. And I've never seen a protest turn that violent that quickly where they started tearing away the barricades, uh, started beating the officers, uh, and then getting past the officers and starting to run up toward the Capitol. I immediately knew things were going bad. So let's talk about the inaction that occurred there. We know President Trump was back at the White House watching on television as this was going on. Uh, there were calls for the National Guard to show up, for reinforcements to show up because of what you just described, it turning so violent so quickly. So walk us through what sort of those conversations you were having, the responses and refusals that you received for people to send help. And instead, as you note in the book, security teams were sent to military leaders' homes who were under no threat whatsoever. Um, I got to tell you, that day, if it wasn't for law enforcement, uh, we'd be dealing with a very terrible situation. Um, the uh, military, so I immediately, 1255, started making my first calls to law enforcement to have them provide assistance. They immediately started providing assistance. Metropolitan Police Department, cannot thank them enough. 
Uh, immediately after that, 1259, I made my first call to the uh, Paul Irving requesting the National Guard. We ran into a couple issues. One, he wanted to run up the chain, so I first had to deal with a 71-minute delay getting the approval from the National Guard from the uh, Capitol Police Board, which I'm required by law. I'm the only police chief in the country that has a federal law that prevents him from bringing in federal resources. So once we got that after 71 minutes, then I had to go and start pleading my case with the Pentagon. 234, I'm on a call with the Pentagon pleading my case to bring the National Guard up, and they're concerned about optics, or again, the look of the National Guard up at the, um, uh, up at the Capitol. What I didn't know is two days earlier, on January 4th, the Secretary of Defense puts out this memo restricting the National Guard from the very resources my men and women would need because they're out there fighting um, a battle that was just a ferocious battle. He restricts them for the very day that it's now obvious they expected to see uh, violence at the Capitol. It was, it was clear. Um, Miller and uh, uh, Secretary of Defense Miller and um, Milley had talked about locking down the city, revoking permits because they were so concerned about violence. Yet they go and restrict the very resources. Now, why do you suspect that happened, Chief? Um, again, it goes back to the concern for the look of the military. I think there, you know, they say that they were concerned that from the demonstrations of 2020, some of the actions of the National Guard during the uh, protests down around the White House or in various cities. George Floyd. Yep. yep mm -hmm. Raised a lot of concerns. If that's the case, why not implement a change in policy that is permanent part of the policy? I mean, there's, there's a defense, um, defense support for civil authorities that's a designated policy. Why not change that? Instead, they just put these, these in place for two days, the very two days my men and women would need their assistance. You gotta understand, what's important is when the police need help and we now dial 911, we're calling the National Guard. They weren't, they weren't there for us. Joe, we've said over and over over the last two years how grateful we are and most Americans are, we should say most Americans, almost every American, for the performance of the Capitol Police, clearly outmanned that day, and with D.C. Metro coming in to help as well. It has to be said that Donald Trump, we now know from all the testimony and the reports we've got, was just sitting in his office. He was asked to call up the guard. He was asked to call, uh, you know, DOJ. He was asked to call the Pentagon and just wouldn't do it. Well, he left him twisting in the wind because... When you take all the testimony together and you put the timeline together, it's very clear he wanted this to happen and he wanted the count stopped, the electoral count stopped. Yep. Um, Chief, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, love, to, love to just express here how much we appreciate your service uh, to the people of D.C. as a police officer and uh, also, of course, your service at the Capitol, uh, not only on January 6th, but uh, in the year and a half before that. I want to ask you a question I've asked uh, people that run the Pentagon over the past several months. Uh, do you have a fear? Did you have a fear then? Do you have a fear now uh, that there are a significant number of members in uh, the Capitol Hill police force that are sympathetic to the cause of the rioters? When you were just talking previously, you had talked about the military and the, and the oath of office. Uh, when you look back and you see the performance of police officers, whether it's Capitol Police, Metropolitan Police, and we had a total of 17 law enforcement agencies uh, come and assist me that day, all the way up to the New Jersey State Police. We all, when the very first day you're going into the academy, you raise your right hand, you swear an oath to the Constitution. Um, regardless, and, and, you know, regardless of anyone's political leanings, things like that, they're police officers. And I think first and foremost, they came and they fought that day. Uh, I had no indication of anyone uh, providing support and backing away specifically because they supported Donald Trump. They were police officers, and I think they all upheld their oath. Well, of course, supporting Donald Trump is one thing. I've got a lot, a lot of friends and family members who voted for Donald Trump twice. Uh, the question is, though, whether they supported his efforts uh, to get those people uh, to disrupt the proceedings. Do, do you have any concerns? Should Americans be concerned that there are a number of uh, police officers in the Capitol Hill force that were sympathetic uh, to his attempts to stop the vote that day by bringing the protesters up to Capitol Hill. Um, you'll know that on the very, ne uh, very next day, on January 7th, I put a statement that I couldn't be prouder for the men and women of the uh, Capitol Police and the hard work they did. Uh, I do right. not think there was any concern that, that we have a problem with uh, uh, People that are uh, extremist Trump supporters uh, at the United States Capitol Police, uh, they are uh, driven uh, in their uh, performance of duty, and I, I wouldn't worry about that one bit. They're going to uphold their oath uh, no matter what. Great. And, Chief, given 
Given the questions that you just heard, um, and overall what what you've written about in, in light of everything that has happened at the Capitol, um, how do you feel? Are you in touch with, as you put it, your men and women? Um, how do you feel the morale of the Capitol Police Force is today? Um, yes, I'm in touch with my my men and women. I talk to them daily, actually, um, sworn and civilian. Everybody went through something that day. Uh, morale is 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 still not where it needs to be. Morale is uh, is still low. Uh, they're they're overworked. Mm. Uh, many are working six days, days a week, sometimes mm. uh, doubles. Um, mm. You know, they're they're very concerned. Just like the reason I wrote this book is the one to defend my men and women, but also I am very worried something like this could happen again. And I think they share that concern. Wow. Um, let me ask you also. I'm just curious. What, what do you think when uh, we've seen, um, especially following January the sixth? Uh, some political commentators mocking police officers uh, who broke down and cried, who were shattered by the experience of being beaten to a pulp uh, by protesters and rioters. Um, and also there are those who seem to take great offense at family members of police officers who died uh, as a result of January the 6th, uh, drawing that connection. Do you draw the connection between the, the officers who died and the riots of January the 6th? Yeah, uh, yes, I draw a connection between the, between the uh, officers that passed away in the, in the riots. It was, a, it was a terrible day. I mean, it was a, a very terrible day. And I still talk to police officers. I went down uh, on Christmas Day and had some coffee with uh, some of the police officers. And even to this day, I have people telling me they can't watch the videos because it's, it, it just impacts them so much. So anyone that would watch a police officer being beaten, like like you're seeing on the screen right now, some stuff that went on and, and denied it, you know, they weren't there. They didn't see what I saw.